Um, welcome everyone to another ECO uh, meeting. Uh, this week we have Christine Lashley, a former colleague uh, uh, when we both were working at the Yellow Barn. Um, it's just such an honor to have you back. It, you know, it's uh, I remember Friday mornings uh, specifically uh, where we both shared the Yellow Barn and kind of there's always a competition for noise if you've ever taught there or been a student there. <laughs> Good uh, but it always Zoom, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but it, with with Christina, it was always nice to to hear her lectures because she's such a gifted orator, and the knowledge that she instills for her students is just is, is always fantastic. So if you get a chance to attend one of her workshops, I guess <laughs> I think yeah. you're still you're still teaching to some degree. Yes, I am. Um, yeah. Or even if you're able to pick up one of her two amazing books or see one of her videos, I do think that she is a fabulous instructor uh, as well as an artist. Uh, and to kind of prove that she's such an amazing artist, she's going to be kind of showing some of her work today. But I'll give you a little bit of a back history on Christine. Uh, she had her BFA from U University of Washington in St. Louis. Um, and her awards, she's been, of course, a, a, a world-renowned plenary artist. But some of the ones that I think come to mind are her uh, Best in Show at Telluride, uh, Best in Show in Bath County, Best in Show in, uh, in Texas. I think it's plenary in Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she was also gracing the cover of Planet Earth magazine, which is a really big deal for those who, those of us, those of you, not me, <laughs> who are, who are uh, Planet Earth artists. Uh, so I want to welcome my good friend and uh, and uh, colleague. I want to call you still my colleague, uh, Christine <laughs> Ashley. <Sure. laughs> Yeah, we've painted together a lot too. I remember. Oh, absolutely! I totally forgot about like the children's yeah. event that we did together. My aunt still has that painting. Book. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's so fun. Uh, well, I welcome people in the pre-chat. I saw a couple of students and um, as thank you for that nice intro, Jordan. Uh, Jordan is a wonderful teacher and awesome artist as well. So he's here at Glen Echo and the Stone Tower. And I did used to teach at Glen Echo classes for a long time. I, I guess I never officially stopped, but life just got really busy. And I thought what I would talk to everybody about today for about uh, 20 minutes, half hour, is just a little bit about my art journey. I do get a lot of questions about, well, how did you get started? Even just recently with the post, people were asking me technical questions about how the plein air uh, events work. And what Jordan had mentioned briefly is that there are competitions that you have to be juried into. Some are open, others are juried, and others are invitational. So it is a competition and you arrive and you compete and you paint as many paintings as you can. And then you try to be objective and say, maybe not all of these are good. How can I take away some? So it's a whole strategy involved. And I thought I would talk about my art journey and what came first. And hopefully this will inspire people to just get out there and be creating. There's definitely room in the professional art competition world, um, exhibiting in galleries or working on these events. Um, there's definitely ways to get started and we welcome new people into the program. And with, without further ado, I'm just gonna jump right into share screen. And uh, I just thought I would start talking about where I started out. My parents encouraged me. This is actually the overgrown gardens at Giverny, believe it or not. This is me when I was like 16, we lived in Paris for four years and you can see the steps are all beaten down. And I have this memory of shaggy gardens. Flash forward to, Today, when they're highly manicured and totally mobbed, you can't even sit up the side there. Uh, so this also, I, I think of myself as town and country artist. So I go camping and paint on location a lot. This was many years ago doing watercolor at a remote cabin. And my classes at the Yellow Barn. So just a, a history of what I've been up to for the past 20 years. And you can see this is 2013. I'm here in DC teaching my students how to paint watercolor on location. Um, for those who have not tried painting on location, maybe you're just a studio painter. 
This is such a lightweight kit. This is my watercolor kit. I do have on my website a link to supplies and all of the things that you see here and all of my tips and techniques are kind of bundled into that supply list. Uh, plus I have a online program where I teach people now with Zoom and live streaming programs and so forth. I'm pretty adept at videos and presentation. And there is not only free resources at Lashley Art Class or christinelashley.com, but you can, again, find those supplies. So here is a class that I, uh, I took these people on location to paint and I was just so proud of them. There they are, little ducks in a row, awesome scene. And my gosh, where do we even start with the magnitude of how great the scene is in Siena? And I try to school people in the idea of um, color dots or just capturing what you can on location. Also, we, this was um, speaking now about the plein air events again, you know, how, how do you get up to speed? How do you create a painting? What actually is going on in my head? How would, if you were interested in a class, what would be happening? If you were interested in getting better as an artist, what would be happening? And maybe you're a collector and you're just interested in the art process. And uh, this was a painting that I did in, um, 2017, it's a nine by 12. And these are my preliminary sketches. I'm trying to decide here where this is gonna reside on the panel. And all of these lines are, how high is this gonna go? Where is the sculpture gonna meet the top edge? What is dark? Here I landed on the idea that the contour, uh, there was something about the bubble contour that was super important. So this was done before an event during the plein air competition, which is called the quick draw. So we only have either two hours or believe it or not, one and a half hours to create a painting. This was a one and a half hour painting. I took a picture because I do like this one. Not all turn out to that same degree. However, we're allowed to do a preliminary study and do a mixture of paint. So my trick is to focus on the value first, light versus dark, and then give myself a jump start with trying out not only the cropping of this, but also to have an idea of the contour. And I apologize in advance if there's a little bit of background noise. I know it's Saturday, but I do have some people working and I have tried to wear my microphone so that hopefully it only captures my sound. Okay, this is another example of preliminary studies and how they would actually affect a final oil painting. So this is watercolor, gouache. This was a gouache done on location. I thought that ended up a little bit heavy. And so I wanted to play around with the light. And this, um, and even though this is a studio painting, it kind of harkens back to the plein air experience. And all of my work is based on that idea of let's go back to the location. Let's be really excited about what we do on location. So this is my current work. This is what I strive hard to create. And I've learned all of these kind of mental games to kind of lock in these images. And I should say at a plein air event, and there's many, um, if, if you have even a mild interest in it, definitely look that up. You can find some links online and there's a plein air magazine, as Jordan mentioned, has a whole listing of events, which, and the caliber of what they are. Is there a jury fee? Are they open? Is it invitational only? So whether you go to look, whether you go to compete, I, I encourage you to try the quick draw. A lot of times they have an open division. Um, and, and there'll be time for some Q&A afterwards if people have questions about that. But getting back to the plein air experience, now I wanna take this into the studio. So it's this whole package of super excitement of the location and how do I extract that? When we're faced with something like the Washington DC cherry blossoms, it's such a fleeting moment in time and gosh darn, you'd be lucky to get a parking spot. 
So how do I pick the right time of day, the right lighting, the right picture? Do I bring my stuff on location? What I end up doing is just taking these color notes or dots. You could see how ultra tiny this is. And I was really interested in capturing some of the delicacy of the blossoms. It is a really special moment in the DC area. Sometimes the weather conspires to actually not have it happen. And then I paired it with what, this is what I call a humble study. This is just in watercolor. This was actually at the remote cabin shore that I uh, had a slide of before. And at first glance, it doesn't really look like anything, but there was something that was caught with watercolor. Again, going back to that color dot or harmony idea, I combined this sketch with this idea of the color harmony and not having it be too dark. I just like that collection of colors. And I did do a study on location of the cherry blossoms in low light. And then I put it all together with this type of image, which was in fact a class demo that I did online. I started it online and then ended up finishing it in the studio. So this represents a hybrid of the experience, the plein air, trying to capture things, working through an idea and having it kind of crystallize in my head. And sure, it is in part from the photo. However, without my plein air experience, nothing like this would have ever happened in the studio. Uh, here's an example of a simple oil setup that I have. Again, you can find this on my um, supply list, just a basic oil box and everything fits in a tidy little backpack. This is what I ended up taking with me overseas. So this is my lighter package that I take for competitions. I go bigger. This was how my painting, which ended up being on the cover of Plein Air magazine turned out um, in the beginning. <laughs> I kind of have this weird way of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, let's paint this. And then boom, the big canvas comes out, the 18 by 24. This is a simple metal easel with a pochade box here. A pochade box is just for oil. And yes, it, that is my organized and cleaned up pochade box, believe it or not. I do paint solvent free. So this is a drippy process with water mixable oils to begin with. Then I switched to traditional paint and this was done over several sessions. And a trick of mine in doing nocturnes is you can paint during the nighttime hours. I, I like the cusp of daylight. So dawn and twilight are the best times. And dawn is really great because there's no, I found scary people out there. Most people are jogging or walking their dog and they're kind of content to leave you alone. And it's a little bit Ah, this was in Richmond for Plein Air Richmond. And uh, let's just say that in a public park in the evening, I lasted until full sunset and that was about it. <laughs> this is the final painting. Um, so just remember if you're in that, uh, I should clarify that at a Plein Air event, it's absolutely forbidden to work from photos. You have to paint from life. And they even some events have you sign a disclosure. I will not paint from a photo. And in fact, most of the artists that are, we call it on the circuit, I, I'm able to visit with a lot of these artists at different events. I see them often. It's really great. Um, we can't do what we do from a photo alone. And it's basically a whole exercise in going beyond the photo. So here was... For Plein Air Telluride a couple of years ago, I saw the scene so beautiful, but again, a lot of clutter and how do you clean that up? I mean, it's all beautiful, but let's take this as raw material. What is the experience? I want height. I want volume. The mountains are like a sock in the eye. You just like, boom, those mountains. I have to capture that. And truly with the photo that is depicted and the, the scene is just showing kind of this tangly grass. And I did do a painting just from this grouping of grasses here, 
But mostly what I want to show you in this example is how I start with my water mixable oils for drawing and toning. So here I am with a 12 by 16 panel I'm on location. The light is changing to some degree. So what I do is go back to that idea of color dots. I'm thinking about foreground, middle ground, background, and I'm trying to relate those together. I wanna to get the raw material. You could see that the light is changing a lot here. And it's surprising that things can just move so quickly. So I usually save shape and edge adjustment until the last little bit. And I just am continuing here. This is how the final painting came out. I did do a little thumbnail study ahead of time, meaning just a little quick sketch, but you could see how the mountain gained in importance and the grasses were suppressed as to which is important. And that's really a great way to kind of clarify. I'm, I'm going around, I'm, I'm very lucky. I know I'm very lucky in what I do, but I've also worked hard for 20 years to decide what gets me excited. And it's not just enough to take a photo and have that be captured on the canvas. I mean, what could I do with this scene? Well, I did a watercolor study on location. You can see that what I was really enamored with is the iridescent quality of light. And the photo just does not depict that. It's very dark. I have this thing right in front of me. Somehow the thing in front of me, that pedestal of flowers, it kind of melted away in the painting. And this was the final image that was created from that. This is a 36 by 36. And I wouldn't, again, would not have been able to create this painting without the preliminary work done on location and just being very excited about what I saw with the dappled light. All right, other sources of influence for me. My kids are so great. Um, they've been with me along on the journey. This is actually the open division at Plein Air Easton. And you can Google that if you want to participate. My kids in 2014 sold both their quick draw paintings. I was so proud of them. And they've been models before for my class. Many of you who have been in the Yellow Barn when I was doing classes have participated with painting my kids. They've been really fantastic support for my career. And they're both working in the arts now as well. Uh, so Easton was one of my first plein air competitions. It was the second one I did. And I thought, holy cow, this is the big leagues. It's sink or swim. And I had a really good time and met some good friends. So again, there's always room for new artists up and coming because that was me in 2014 just toss your hat in the ring and get started. Here you can see the beginning stages of my wonderful patina of my larger post shot box, which is what I take for most of my plein air events. And that is the Easy Owl. And again, you can find that in the supply list. I do like this format because it allows me to go big. Here I am painting this boat on location. And this is an eight by 10 panel. Easton is a wonderful event. We are invited to private properties. There's a lot of chances to pre-sell work. There's, avid, you know, where are the collectors? Who's gonna buy my painting? I just can't advocate enough the wonderful quality of plein air events. You have a team of people working to promote your art. You have clients that want to learn about how art is created. And all that we do is the artists, we're, we come, we show up, we paint, and there, there's a huge infrastructure for selling your paintings, and often they give you free food, so that's really great. Here is towards the twilight hours. This was an evening event where during the course of, now Easton spans 10 days, and these were patrons that came to see artists paint and then they purchased paintings and this was ahead of the main event. Plus it was all catered and we had air conditioned bathrooms. So that's really great. When else do you get that when you're plein air painting? Not very often. So here's the event itself at the museum that they have in Easton. 
I realized that year that, holy cow, a lot of people go big. I might want to go bigger when I'm doing plein air. Another huge influence on my work is just travel and going to Paris. And this was a scene where I took my students and I ended up doing this after I got back. Uh, the quality of light just couldn't be captured in that photo. You could see there's just a huge division of light and dark. And I was interested in the, mid the middle area, that medium quality of light, and I shifted everything into a higher key. Another example of how I work, this was just in the woods. This is a very small gouache painting. I have not developed this into a larger image, but overabundance of jumble in the photo. And what I latched onto was the, this kind of grouping or chain of pastel rocks. And it's kind of interesting to see that I gravitate towards that same palette, whether it's in the city, or it's there in nature. These are just things I'm attracted to, painting white things. So then I thought, I'm in Charleston, it's rainy, how could I switch this into a scene that I like? And here's my 30 by 40, which drains everything predominantly of color. It kind of celebrates the rain into thinking of that more, I guess more like uh, that, a point of interest of white objects. What can you do with white? How can I group my dark objects and minimize that and then kind of highlight the creamy quality of the sky and, and a little bit of dreaminess with the paint and to, to kind of suggest the wet windshield. Uh, more about travel. This was a, one of my most fantastic memories was painting on location. In Giverny Gardens, you're not allowed to do that anymore. I did take a lucky group of students. About half of them were crying. It was so moving to be there on location. They allow, they used to allow artists ahead of time um, of the public uh, opening of Giverny. So early at dawn and then after closing, which are the best times to paint anyway. It was in his will that artists be allowed to paint there. And now, sadly, the world is just a different place. And they've decided to not have that function as part of the Giverny Foundation. So I do hope they bring it back one day. Um, this, so I did oil. I did watercolor. And this led to a series. Here is how, I again, I start my painting. And this actually was a demo for one of my Glen Echo classes and going bigger and taking an idea that's a simple idea and watercolor. This is quite simply the water's edge. So notice the, the capture of the photo is adhering to lots of darks and kind of a tangly aspect to the garden. When I was there in person, I thought the color of that water was so spectacular. I was really interested in the fringe of the near shore. And there was just something kind of iridescent about that. And this photo did a better job of capturing that. And this is the early stage, mid stage, and final stage of that painting. And again, bringing the plein air experience into the larger piece of work. And this was, it's either 2436 or 3040. I'm obviously very influenced by Monet's work. This is Musée Montmartin in Paris. And the, the half finished quality and the kind of loopy brushwork, I thought, wow, look, he's digging the same thing I am. Look at that blue. Oh, I was just so excited. So another point of inspiration for me is when I can look at other artists' work and there is, it's, it's a multifold process. I've painted it, he's painted it. Because I've painted it, I almost see deeper into the painting and his process. So instead of copying this necessarily, how could I use this painting as a jumping off point to further develop my own work? And this was the painting that I created based on my experience painting on location at Giverny and also what Monet saw. So it encouraged me to go looser. You can see the half finished brush marks that were happening here. And I really loved this painting. Um, it, it 
it did what I wanted to do, which was kind of break outside my own mold and have just a really good time with some paint. I mentioned that my children inspire me and here is my daughter modeling on the Riviera for my class. And I did this really quick painting. Um, so watercolor also inspires me. I try to have some of the drippy, loose nature of watercolor. I stopped at this point. This actually was a demo on how to not paint features and how to capture sunlight. And plus I advocate have clarity of thought. Is my subject light or is my subject dark? Here the subject is light. So we practice the idea of grouping the figure against a darker background. So a lot of times when I say simplify or do a study, people are kind of overwhelmed by that. But if you, if you say to students, you have to choose, is your subject light, is your subject dark? It can really drive a lot of the importance of the painting. And even though this is an oil and a lot of detail has been added, including features, it's that same idea of deciding here I actually flipped it and my figure is dark and the background is light. And one thing that I uh, tell my students is that if you're ever in doubt as to what is happening with the value, you could see that the flesh tone here and indeed everything is grouped with what I'm uh, there's a terminology of closer value or compressing your value. And you can even see this idea of a bridge to the background. So she doesn't have a sharp halo around her. Also here, there's a bridge to the background. So movements where the eye can kind of move from one to the other is really important. And now when we bring back the color, it seems extra strong. So that's just kind of a fun way to either look at master artwork or try to tease out some of the value patterns in your own sketches that you may have. This is an example of just really the, the most crude color dot studies with that idea of what is light, what is dark and paint with intent. So I have, here I have a tree trunk that is light and my background is dark. So that drives every single brush mark. I hope that clatter is not catching for everybody. I Again, I apologize about the noise. Uh, and here we have a tree that is light with the background dark. And then just practicing for students, you know, okay, maybe you can't draw the shape of that tree. Let's try mixing some browns. Let's do a light, medium, and dark brown. Can you do that in watercolor? So this was the location. Here's a study that I did of my own. Um, so I have what I call teaching demos where it's like an exercise that we're going to do together. And then this is a painting I did for my own benefit. Sometimes I would arrive early to the location and I loved the progression of greens and have left this up on my studio wall for a while. So this looks like a hot mess, but this is how I'm going to start a green painting based on the CNO canal. So loose watery start thinking about foreground, middle ground, background thinking about the chip of the sky. And here I'm kind of fleshing out the greens and deciding about warmest greens in the foreground. I'm progressing back with greens have a loss of yellow as they go back in the distance. So that's the first color that's lost. Red is still present in mid greens. And then finally red is lost as well and it goes to blue. So I have full on yellowy green going to a more purple and finally a really muted purple. And if we go back to my study, you see that we are seeing purple in this distance. Rarely do we see green in the distance. And there's the location shot. That's a lot of green. Yay, Washington DC environment. Woohoo, with hundred degrees and lots of humidity. And here's the final painting where you can see where I'm really celebrating those layers in the landscape. And again, my study and being on location and knowing my environment is going to make a big difference in how I work with that type of imagery. Another point of inspiration is not being afraid of completely demolishing an old painting. 
In this painting, I was working really large and it's easy to stop. I, I get asked a lot by students, should I keep going? It, the painting isn't what I wanted to say, or, oh, I'm afraid to do any adjustments to it because I might ruin it. I say, go ahead and ruin that painting because why do we need another mediocre painting? At a certain point in your growth, you have to be ruthless as to how to get better. You have to just be humble and know there's always going to be artists that are better from better than you. They're going to win more of the prizes and they're going to have better composition. So get busy and get to work. And even if you're just painting for fun, how much fun is it to completely always have a lateral move? You do want to get better. So here is a series of the walkthroughs of what I did to this painting. I kept repainting it. I reshaped the mountains. I reshaped the clouds. I simplified. I took away the critters. I had an increase of lower light. And this is just some of the stuff I did to this painting. If you're looking at the date up top, we're going through several months. And I worked on this for about half a year. So here I'm starting to rekey in a higher key, what, and even catching some shine for this. And with oil, you have to add a subsequent dot of oil when you're going over with heavy layers. And here's what the final painting ended up like. I recalled that it what is my subject light, is my subject dark? It's a dark division. I was getting all jumbly in the background and I needed to put these trees up against a lighter sky. So if we look at the simplicity, sometimes it's easier than we think. So if we look at the simplicity of the statement that is said, in black and white, plus this link to the background. And I, what happens is, how do you know when a painting is done? Well, I did this and I invented the river and I'm like, yes, that's what I meant to say. So my brain was just, it was like an itch. It was something that needed to be done with the painting. It wasn't right, it wasn't right, it wasn't right. And then I thought, now it's right. Plus I liked a lot of the texture that came out of that. And it just seemed to read from the distance and read in black and white. So this is some of my, here's my kids, once again, in Jaberni, of course. So putting it all together, this is uh, an exhibit that I had in 2020. I have a great gallery that I now work with. And I'm, I'm just here to tell any aspiring artist that this is a place I never thought I would be. I thought, I'm just happy traveling. I'm happy teaching my class, painting on location. If I get into an event, boy, that's a bonus. And I just feel so lucky to have a gallery that I work with that will mount a show like this. And I, I, it's possible, people. You can start from very, very humble beginnings. That's all I have to say. I. I have, and just keep being ruthless with your work and, and working on it. You can see here, I have a whole water series. And just to touch briefly on my abstractions with the city, this was something I saw and I'm like, yeah, well, what could I do with that? So I've just been going more abstract with cities and um, that was a while ago. Plus ways that I would change the photo, this, this terrible stuff here that needed to go, but notice I kept the car. I thought the car was interesting and I shifted that quality of light. So again, so inspiring, but we can't just copy that photo. Here's the final painting that came from that. I shifted around the light and I remembered at the time that gardens are predominant in Charleston. So that's what needed to be featured not a crazy orange building. So just shifting your intent and your focus makes a big difference. Um, and then I do wanna open this up to some Q and A. So I just thought I would, again, just, I think it's always interesting. I remember being fascinated by the photo and then the reference. And just remember that in the case of these paintings, it, it looks like, oh my gosh, how did you even get there? But there's a, a long story of plein air intent, doing notes, 
Um, sometimes I will match the beauty of kind of the abstract small watercolor study and literally I match those pigments to create a painting like that. Um, so I, oh, here's, here's just, we'll just uh, wrap it up here. And I do have some extra stuff in case people don't have questions, but people might have some questions. So I did want to just say that uh, this was recently at Telluride. I have the idea, and, and it is safe to set up in the middle of the street in Telluride. <laughs> Believe it or not, cars are mandated to only go 15 miles an hour. And by now in year 20, Plan Air Telluride is celebrated each year. And um, the native folk, uh, the, the, the rare people that actually <laughs> live in Telluride are like, oh, yay, Plan Air is here. Anyway, notice what I'm doing. My intent is to do a night scene, and I want it to be kind of abstracted. I have clarity of intent in the fact that I'm flipping my value. I know that the entire foreground is going to be dark, and I know that the mountains light up for about 10 to 15 minutes if I'm lucky they will turn orange and glow and cameras can't capture that, but I'm setting up the scene based on what I've seen before. And I'm using the daytime to sketch out the accuracy of my design. So in essence, in full, uh, you know, start as you need to carry on, I'm creating a black and white study right here on the canvas. So no preliminary sketch, just jumping in and doing it in full daylight. Here I'm capturing my color dots. Notice the painting is still kind of raw, but there's those crazy orange mountains that it's just so beautiful that the, the photo is doing weird things to it, but there's no doubt that it is a totally awesome scene. And then here the orange light has left, but I'm able to capture more with now the, the glow of the city lights. So a, a plein air painting can encapsulate that two to three hour time window. And as I mentioned before, with the Richmond scene, you can come back several times to create your painting, but color dots first, shape later, and first and foremost, knowing is my subject light, is my subject dark? Because even at this stage here, there's a lot of jazz going on with the lights and a point of excitement. But the nucleus of this painting is the dark, ragged edge of the tops of the buildings against that lighter aspect of the mountains. I brought that idea into this it was just a very, very crude study I banged out here. And here you could see the study. And, and after this series, I'm gonna um, do some Q&A for folks. Uh, so here's just a little six by eight study. Here's my trusty value scale. And just to go back to the idea of what value is all about on the value scale here in the light grouping, I decided that I'm going to have the, the study shows what is going to happen. All of this is going to be more neutralized and gray and dark. And then I'm going to have sky and water be lighter. And because all of these values are the same, this is all the same value. And you might be saying, wait, how can, they're different colors, true. But I'm mixing the color in accordance with the same value. Check this out. I did a pretty good job. These maybe are a half value different. So I wasn't checking with my phone, but now with phones, it's so easy to just double check that. So again, color and notice even my darks are spanning between warm and cool. So this is a value three and this is a value eight. And you can find those here on the value chart. So the whole painting is based on that. And here's my setup with the palette and the final painting. Um, this is just the water mixable start. You can see I have the study here and you can see I'm melting the edges and using this as kind of a watercolor background. Um, I, I work on the design in real time. And I'm also starting to think about the warm areas of gray in the front and the cooler areas of gray in the background. I spend some time with that boat 
I want to just kind of tone. I, people ask, do you tone your canvas? Not really, but kind of. So I think of it more as selective toning. And here's another stage. And then when I'm ready to actually paint my paint, I take those blobs of color and you can see, I can kind of do whatever I want with the color. I could add the blue, it is turning into green. But in the final painting with the studies that I've done, let's just go back to that final painting here. You can see that there's blue in here and just all types of colors because I've already established what the tight value range is going to be. And yes, I've done studies on location uh, of Paris and bridges, and that's just really important. Well, just to wrap it up, uh, there's a lot of camaraderie with art. Um, do try to travel with friends. These are some friends I just went to Paris to paint, to learn about uh, for a week. And we had a great time. We all learned from each other and we pretty much talked shop the whole time. I do have a podcast on that um, that you can find a link to on my website. And then I have a friend who's a fantastic artist. He and I did a program together called Beyond the Easel. He has a really cool um, back setup for his truck and I've painted with him a lot. Um, but I, I have my way of painting. He has his way of painting. He's a phenomenal artist, Scott Christensen. And he has a great studio. And he's one of the reasons I'm building my studio. He inspired me a lot. And uh, so make room for some art friends. It's pretty cool to have art friends that you meet on your travels and find out who inspires you. So I, I hope people... Uh, are you know still awake after all of that art oh that was so amazing Kristen. thank you so much uh we have some uh, comments and questions that i can kind of bounce your way um uh, the first one was kind of regarding uh the uh solvent free painting can you talk a little bit about that i know that's like a, a gigantic topic but can you sum it up maybe sure and i i've written a lot of stuff for that there there's uh if you go to christinelashley.com and click about um, there's actually a blog post about that I've written for Plein Air magazine and also Oil Painters for Amer of America. So there's a lot more information out there about that. It, it's actually fairly simple. I start with, as I showed in the video, the I, I do paint totally solvent free. That means no medium because most mediums contain solvent. And it also means that I have a healthy environment. And people say, well, do you worry about paint on your hands? Not really, because pigments can't migrate through your hands as long as your skin barrier is intact. The bad thing about oil painting is when you use solvent. So any medium, any solvent, so solvent can be a medium, but also cold wax contains um, bad stuff in it. So you don't wanna breathe any of that in. So I've just taken out all toxic vapors uh, from my environment and from my working situation. It also means I could show up in Paris and boom, whip out my paints and start painting. So it's water mixable to start, but often I just go right to direct painting, which means I'm putting out paint and I'm painting. Like how simple is that? It's just the most simple way you can work. But don't forget my watercolor training of being mindful of my value and knowing is my subject light, is my subject dark. So I'm painting with intent at all times. And that actually is how you can paint solvent free because you're not trying to find your way. You're not thinking, oh, I'll paint over this later. So I really am very linear when I paint. And it also helps me do a good quick draw because I'll spend a lot of time in that early stage working out my design in real time on my panel. So it's kind of a long-winded answer, maybe not what people would expect. It goes back to what I was talking about with clarity of intent, with value, and, and being comfortable with direct painting. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, uh, water's mixable oils kind of fall in that, in that grouping and why you chose water's um, Visible oils. Sure. I mean, basically what's not to love, you know, clean up with soap and water and no toxicity. So the only thing I found with 
Okay, anybody can be an alla prima painter. You can also start a little bit with oil, uh, but if anybody knows anything about oil painting beyond oil painting 101, there's this idea of fat over lean. And what I realized is that the water mixable oils, if my plan is to cover over the water mixable oils, they become very thin and they dry to the light touch within about 10 minutes and sometimes faster. The humidity level in Colorado recently was 8%. Yes, everything was dry. My fingernails were pretty much chipping and falling off. So I, I came back to the heat and humidity of DC and I was like, oh, it feels great for about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I know people, people have so many questions about that. People say, I'm taking a workshop with you because I want to learn about that. I do have an online program and uh, there are free videos for anybody to look at if you sign up. I, this is a recent class that we're um, doing. This has uh, the, you know, there's a welcome video and uh, it goes through all the different types of demos. This was a recent demo that I posted. It goes full screen, but I walk people basically through, oh, this was painting over an old painting. And um, <laughs> so I started out with this. And uh, so here's an idea where, I mean, I'm just direct painting with the knife. And so that's another way to do it, um, where you just you add a dot of walnut oil and just get busy painting. Yeah, you, you mentioned that you, uh, about kind of, uh, don't be afraid to demolish paintings. There was a question about that. Is that kind of what you're referring to here is just attack it afterwards and... Well, sometimes I like to use a, an old painting um, just for the texture. And um, plus, I do get questions a lot from students about like, well, hey, what, you know, what is that thing that um, you mentioned, you know, can you really paint over an old painting? Don't I need to prime it first? No, don't prime it. Just paint over, scrape down the nubbies and then paint over it. No problem. Um, so. I would, it's like I answer the question or I say the statement that you could just direct paint, but I know people still get confused because it's almost like you have to be comfortable. It's actually, you have to know your values a little bit better in order to ha and have that practice and have that confidence. And truthfully in destroying an old painting, it does give you some confidence. It's kind of liberating. Totally. And when you're doing kind of more direct painting, uh, I know that some uh, paint brands tend to be drier and some tend to be wetter. Do you have a favorite that you work with uh, so you're able to drop the solvents? Yes. M. Graham is great. Um, I do like Vasari. Sometimes they act, I can't do the vertical palette with Vasari because they do slide off. Uh, Gamblin, um, they are very supportive of the arts and they do have high quality paint. However, it just doesn't work for me because they're so stiff. So I don't like Gamblin, even though I know other artists do. Also Rembrandt dries really fast. So that would be another disadvantage of my method is I can never fully clean up my palette because there's always kind of paint hanging around. And in order to clean my brushes, I just dip them in walnut oil and then I can clean up with soap and water. So that's detailed on my supply list as well. Cool. And I have actually a comment. I'm sorry to occupy. I'm, I mean, this isn't all me, by the way. I'm actually reading comments. <laughs> so I'm not just like hogging the screen here. Uh, but the one question I did have that was personally just mine. Uh, when you go to a plein air competition uh, and you're expected to paint over a certain amount of time, how do you get familiar with the land? How do you get uh, kind of a sense of what you want to paint? Do you just kind of wander around for a day and, and sketch and draw? Or how does how do you plan your visit to, let's say, Telluride? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I'm getting ready to do Plan Air Easton. And anybody who's local in the area, you can get a pallet pass. Um, so my plan for Easton is to be I, I like to look at different artists. I mentioned that briefly in the program to the, there was this point of inspiration with Monet. So artists that I'm looking at in preparation for Easton are um, Edward Sego, who did a lot of boats and like low country scenes. And also I'm looking at artists, of course, John Singer Sargent who painted white boats. So I might have this kind of general idea of 
gosh, when I'm there, I'm going to be looking. Remember, I like to paint white things. And so finding a building in early light. Um, also, there's an area I want to revisit. And I, I do like marshes where I kind of can be visually participating in when the shallows kind of flip in value. I like that. Am I seeing through the water? Am I seeing on top of the water? Is, is this muddy? Is this reflecting the sky? I, I like it when my brain can engage with something like that. So those types of scenes make me happy. What do, I've learned what doesn't make me happy is like old beat up trucks, alleyways. Every now and again, I've tried to challenge myself to paint like city gritty stuff. And usually it ends up pretty. And I used to kind of apologize for that. I'm sorry, I paint pretty things. And then I realized other people do that really well. They paint rusty trucks. And so why should I, um, yes, expand on what you want, challenge yourself. Those are good artistic things to do. But in the case of Easton, I've prepared for it and I need to hit the ground running. It's not a, it's not a time for exploratory painting. I need to perform. I need to have my training, have my back, and I need to perform at the level of subject matter that I know is going to be good for me. Cool. Uh, well, now I'll actually open the floor to other people. Okay. <laughs> Lots of questions. Sorry, I don't. I, yeah, I, have more I did. Things, so. I did see in the chat. Um, somebody was asking about solvent free and water mixable to start. Uh, color layout of your palette and a uh, walnut oil. Yeah, I would just suggest that uh, mostly it's a rainbow, warm and cool of each color, whether it's watercolor or oil, and just check out my supply list at the Lashley Art Class dot com. Um, and, and I pretty much just talk about the warm and cool of each color. I've learned also that I don't like a limited palette, even though I realize there's advantages to that. Um, my nod to mostly thinking in terms of value is I've, I've challenged myself to edge closer to staying in the gray area to begin with. So in real time, doing a value study on my panel. Great. Yeah. And somebody asked, what is the walnut oil for? I would just Google the term fat over lean and you'll find so much information. I think your head might explode, <laughs> but basically it just means that any subsequent layer of paint needs to be oily. And that can quite physically be a dot of walnut oil. Some artists use linseed oil, but I found that has an odor to it. And walnut oil doesn't yellow as much over time. It, it, uh, painting best practices is a good, um, on Facebook, there is a group called Painting Best Practices. And it's uh, George O'Hanlon and I forget the other guy. But they run, it, it's a resource for artists and it talks about current practices. I've personally to uh, make sure that I'm working with archival practices. That's what we're talking about here is you don't want a painting that's gonna fall apart later, whether it's in two years cracking because you didn't follow good oil protocols or 20 years down the line where your whites get yellow. And so walnut oil has a good clarity of uh, when it oxidizes fully. So there's dry to the light touch and then full oxidation. And in fact, oil continues to oxidize over time. So I've visited with the Smithsonian. You can make an appointment at the Smithsonian to visit their lab. And they were doing a test study of water mixable oils and um, people are continuing to find out about that. I've talked to the people, the chemists that are making those paints and the manufacturers and they are, there's a lot of misinformation out there on the water mixable oils. And in fact, there's a lot of misinformation about oils in general. Some people say, well, those aren't real paint. Um, yes, they are, they are real paint. And it, it's, it's just important to adhere to that fat over lean idea. So there's, there's books written about oil practices. I've pretty much outside the scope of this art chat to talk about that. And, and I think those are good questions to ask, but there's a lot of information you can learn about on your own and be careful of what, I would just say this, be careful of what information you take in. 
always be questioning that. I think there's always ways that we could be learning about that. I think that in truth, manufacturers could do a little bit better uh, sharing of information. It was artists that um, I guess about 20 years ago had the paint label be legible because before that we didn't know like what pigment makes up ultramarine blue. Is French ultramarine the same as ultramarine? And what about ultramarine deep? And what about watercolor versus oil versus acrylic? So now you can actually read the back of your paint label and understand what is in the paint label. And so educate yourself about your materials. You won't be sorry, that's time well spent. Yeah, a good oil painting book um, is, it goes a long way. And if you don't have one, ask an instructor like us. <laughs> Uh, I, have, I have books on my uh, website as well. Some of my favorites. yeah, you guys should totally buy them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get any kickback. I just think they're great books. Um, well, thank you so much, Christine. It was so wonderful to talk to you today. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? I'm looking at the chat, and also I think you can unmute yourself and ask a question. I have a question. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Have you ever been tempted to? to complete your um, watercolor or your gouache uh, study, or even to develop that and hand that in for in the plein air? Oh, uh, yes. Um, I, I used to, I, I kind of skipped over the early, you know, Christine's early years. I did professional watercolor portraits and I did teach watercolor classes and I exhibited my watercolors. So I was a professional watercolorist for about uh, 10, 20 years. I was the president of Potomac Valley Watercolor Society. And I just, um, gouache is a little bit newer to me. Um, uh, Scott has tried to teach me gouache and I tried to teach him transparent watercolor. And we both, um, <laughs> Agreed, disagreed. Yeah, that was so interesting. Uh, but that's another hour to talk about that. Uh, but anyway, um, I do show that on occasion, but mostly it's oil. I think it's important. I mean, look, I've given up cooking, my cooking hobby, my gardening hobby, my sewing hobby, and now the kids have left the home. So all focus is on my art. And I, I think it is important not to, you want to do other things, but don't dilute what you're doing. And for me, it's media specific as to oil is doing what I want it to do visually now, so. I have a question, Christine. Yeah. First of all, I just wanna thank you for being here this morning. It's really good to see you. Oh, you too, Penny. These are just out of this world. The luminosity is fantastic. Um, I have one question about color. When I'm painting outdoors, even in shade, and I take my paintings indoor, the colors look different. How do you adjust for that? Or what, do you have any, um, you know, um, information, you know, on how to handle that? Yes, it is a huge factor. Um, there, there's many things at play. And I would encourage you to go to Oil Painters of America. Um, they have a free blog post and you can search for the blog post and a um, colleague of mine, Dave Santianas, did a whole thing about color light. And in building my studio, um, that was something that I was very obsessive about, north light. So to, to specifically answer your question, Penny, it, it, it's not you. There's two factors at play. The, the light and the quality of light outside is so great that usually when you bring it indoors, it, it's just you're working with so many less lumens that you, you just can't compensate for that. So there's oftentimes when I do a study that I think is good on location, but if I bring it indoors, I know it's too dark. And you can either, to use that as reference, you can either take a picture and adjust it in Photoshop to crank up the value and, and just like shift that bar up literally. So that's one way to use it. You can also put that under a spotlight. Um, to have control in my own studio, I find that I work best with ambient light. I don't work well with hot spotlights on my work. And when I had my smaller studio, I would work with the lights kind of pointed up at the sky or at the ceiling. And in a plein air situation, specifically as to your plein air point, 
Um, I work only under an umbrella or shade. And I rarely, if, if ever, would work in full sun. Another way to combat that is to have a neutral gray on your palette and know exactly which value you're working from. If you find yourself reaching for darker and darker value or lighter and lighter value, your whole value system has gone off. And in a span of about 10, you should really only work here and you can shift it up or down just a little bit. But if you're if you're reaching for darker and darker paint, you should tell yourself, oh no, it's off. I, I should, I have to pretty much adjust everything else. So it's it all goes back to value once again. Hear that everyone? Get an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Telling no, my I entire do. my plenary class, like nobody got umbrellas. It's like, oh no, you guys are gonna be a burnt and your colors. Well, are umbrellas are a pain. I've seen them blow are. into a river and crash sets. I mean, they're a total pain in the rear. And so it's another reason to like train yourself for some memory painting or because I can work pretty much from, I've tried to train myself to work from memory. So I always set up in the shade. However, I would like to say that my friend, his, his name's Jim Woodark. You can look up his work. He paints in full sun. And I'm like, what are you doing? First of all, you're going to go blind. And he's like, well, I got my hat on. And he's like, yeah, I just put everything like, I adjust the value like two or three degrees and he paints in full sun. And I'm like, you're a crazy man. He's like, you it's just have a ton of was such a hassle, you know? Because if you- I, I can't, I can't do that. I hope it, at least it's a tone canvas because you can get sun blindness. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he's a crazy. little bit, he's a little bit. <laughs> Christine. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Christine, it's Linda Kirvin. Hi, Linda. Um, hi, how nice to see you. I enjoyed it. You mentioned Photoshop a few minutes ago. Um, I have a new computer and my Photoshop that I used before does not transfer to the uh, new computer. Um, and I'm wondering what Photoshop you do use or I've heard a lot of artists now just use their iPhone that the iPhone is so advanced that you can do any color correcting or take um, photos of your finished painting with that rather than doing any correcting in Photoshop. Um, yes, I have answers to all of those things. It's <laughs> it's a woolly world we live in. Everything is subscription and unless you're making a lot of money as an artist, um, Photoshop will eat up much of your art budget. And then if you add on, I bought Adobe Creative Suite, which had an illustrator and InDesign, which is, um, I get asked a lot how I, how did you do your books, Christine? Because I, I do have some books on my website. I think I have like four books by now. So the, uh, the Creative Suite will do that Photoshop and it's, it's all wonderful and very professional and fantastic stuff, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't upgrade to any computer. And, um, yes, it's, it's yes. A clue for artists. So there's a couple of solutions. One is you could do Photoshop elements, which is about a hundred dollars. And it has the functionality that you would need to basically manipulate your images. So that's a good one to check out. If you're looking at how to, like in the case of Penny, where she had a study that was too dark, uh, you can actually use Procreate, which is pretty wonderful. And that will dovetail with the iPhoto. I, I do not recommend tweaking images in iPhoto. It, it technically can be done, but for example, like in my program, I have, how do I actually manipulate my photo for a competition? And I would not use an iPhone photo. First of all, the new iPhones are, they're too smart. So they're, they automatically sharpen. You can actually take a photo and it's a good photo. And then boom, you see it like get hyper sharpened. So now I'm, um, you know, but anyway, so, so that's a different thing. So I, I don't use iPhone photos to submit to a contest usually because they're too sharpened and they're too colorized. Uh, so you could try Procreate for some design ideas. Like in the case of Penny, like she could bring it into 
procreate and maybe adjust some shapes or or do something like that to adjust her sketch without destroying her final painting, you can actually digitally manipulate. So, so Procreate is good for the digital manipulation that Photoshop used to do. So try Photoshop Elements and uh, Procreate. Procreate's 10 bucks on the iPad. Okay, so that's, a, that's an app. Is that an app? That's an app, yeah. Yes. I, Adobe I also did... does a package that's just Lightroom and Photoshop for like $10 a month, which is really all you need. And what is that, um, Jordan? Adobe that does Photoshop and, and uh, yes. Lightroom. But well, I, I think for a lot, for artists, don't sleep on Lightroom. It really helps with photographing your artwork to send out to competitions and stuff too. Is is Lightroom, do mm -hmm. you think? Okay, because I had CS2, which is Creative Suite 2, and it won't transfer, um, I don't know. And then I thought, well, should I just buy Elements? Is that similar? Or and then someone said, well, I just use my iPhone. Um, so I'm kind of in a quandary, and I'm without any Photoshop except my old computer, which takes about 20 minutes to actually warm up. So <laughs> I was glad that Christine mentioned it. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, uh, Christine, I, I want to... I... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Are we out of time? Uh, probably, but <laughs> just Christine one quick question. Uh, well, it's not very quick. Sorry, <laughs> uh, Christine. Uh, when you're doing your value study, do you um do you design your darks and lights so they can read better, or you pretty much follow whatever is in front of you? Like the no, I'm, design, I'm definitely designing. Um, I'm spending the time to design. I'm spending the time to find that clarity of intent because it, it's not enough just to copy the scene. I'm okay, so you have to like put them in a pattern that is like pleasing to the eye or how do you design it in a way that you design it by grouping things together it, it remember when i did the uh the first time i snipped something to black and white in fact the solution is simpler than you think it, it's sometimes i finish a painting and i'm like oh, why did it take me so long to get there but the solution is often clarity. It's, it's not adding more stuff. It's not adding more value shift. It's actually grouping and compressing your value. That means snipping it into this is my dark area and this is my light area. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Anybody All right. Can I wrap it up? A question, <laughs> Jordan. Jordan. Yes. And Christine. Hi, Zan Rosalie. Nice to see you, Christine. Hi, um, I have a question about lighting. Uh, this is a follow up on the light dark issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you like to paint in natural light and that's that's great. And natural light is sort of, um, uh, you know, it depends upon the circumstances. In your studio, you may be getting a lot of reflection from the trees and whatever in the spring. But to cut this short, when you paint outdoors and then you come inside and you're working on your paintings and it's at night and you have to use um, lighting. Uh, do you use incandescent lighting or do you use, uh, when I, I find when I use something that's called daylight, it's so blue that I really can't cope with it. What kind of lighting, what temperature do you use in your studio? Um, lighting is a big issue and I would refer you to that Dave Santiana's Oil Painters of America post where okay. he he goes into lumens, he goes into color, temperature, color cast. In the case of my studio, I am having the lights at 4,000 Kelvin, but I also have uh, big panels of light that can swing between 320 and up to like 5,200. And then also in my studio, these lights are going to be able to go from, I think, um, digitally with a app is going to be between 28 and like up to 10,000, which is like super cold so it i mean you know i just said a lot of like nerdy light stuff because you do have to know about lighting also i found it just can't be too bright um i've designed my studio where mostly with the lights off during daylight hours is going to be perfect because predominantly it's a wall of windows that are going to be looking north and like the windows behind me that are going to be west, I will be able to just block those off if I need to. But they're, the studio is big enough that the light can't fall in 
all that much in the studio. Anyway, um, my suggestion for nighttime painting is uh, one of the best lights is uh, it's expensive, but it's a rebel light and that can go super low. And so that would be good for like a very small home studio situation. The light quality is really beautiful. And I just would suggest having that on low. Um, they, they sell 12 inch and 24 inch, and then you can mount that to your easel. So that's, that's something that is good. And surprisingly at night these days, um, I, I used to bring my rebel light. It's too cumbersome now, especially with FAA regulations. It's hard. I've been stopped with like, what is, what is this battery pack? What are you using that for? So I'm like, okay, note to self, no big battery packs anymore. Um, but you can just use your phone at like a four, hold it up at a 45 degree angle, like those Paris scenes. I just double check. I know where everything is on my palette and I know the value when I start out and I paint into low light. So now I'm all about easy. So I've trained myself to paint my nocturne where I finish, where I want to finish, and then I don't need a night light. But if you're talking about bringing it back in the studio, so so an iPhone flashlight is good in a pinch on location just to kind of finish stuff up a little bit. It gives you pretty good light and pretty clear and pretty true. So that's great. And then just in the studio, you do have to get a color corrected bulb. They do sell them, but in addition to all of the other stuff that I was mentioning, there's it's either Cree or CRI, which is the color rendering index. And so that measures the visible spectrum. So it's not just enough to go to Home Depot and get like, oh, look, it says daylight. You actually have to know the Kelvin temperature and you have to know the color rendering index and high color render index bulbs are very expensive. And that's why the Rebel Light is around $500. But I mean, if you know it's that or hire an electrician to put in a full lighting system, and, and they're getting better, like LED lights are getting better. The, the stuff I have in my studio is only 90 CRI and what you would ideally want is 95 plus. But the reason I chose that is like the technology is just not there yet. And I've got like, you know, 30 lights in my studio now. So um, the, but the newer lights, they, they're gonna be standing on a panel and those have 95 plus uh, light capacity. And though for the pair, it was only like 200 bucks. So that's another option is it's, um, you can just on, um, I think I got mine off of Amazon and I, I should put that up on my supply list because it's a good source of, it, it's just, I would say this, that um, it's like a little jangly when I look at it, like I have to have it low and, it's just hard, unless it's North Light, North Light's ideal and mostly painting in the day because I don't like bright, glary things. So it's still hard to work in artificial lighting situations. So what was that called, the last one? Newer. Newer, I don't know, N-E-E-W-E-R. Okay. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Uh, we've yeah. taken up so much of your time today, but I do want to remind everyone uh, in two weeks, uh, Tim Tate, who is a, probably one of the most, uh, he, he calls himself a uh, queer glass artist, and he is absolutely phenomenal. I really recommend everyone attend it. It is being hosted by none other than uh, Jamie Ann Jacobin, who is the director of the, of the, um, of the Renwick. So, I mean, your host of itself is a big deal, but uh, Tim Tate is probably, he kind of rounds out our, our trio of the Washington Glass School. So I, I highly recommend checking out our, our ACO in two weeks. Uh, we are sponsored by the, um, to some degree, by the state of Maryland with the Arts Council. Uh, we also are grateful for any donations from our viewers. So uh, it's free to anybody, but you know, best way you can support us is word of mouth and attending our, our talks. So thank you again to Christine and Mariana, uh, who's enjoying Greece, I hope. <laughs> um, and we'll see you guys uh, all in two weeks. Very good. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Right. Fantastic. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.